This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics and never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. In 2011, a British security contractor named Dave Smith was found dead. He'd been drinking in a bar and then, while walking outside, was kidnapped, thrown into a shallow grave, and shot. His bloodied body was then covered with earth, buried on the order of his boss, a man known to his associates as the Mastermind. This was one of many assassinations carried out by hitmen working for one of the most unusual and intelligent criminals in modern times. That criminal is Paul LaRue, a brilliant programmer who branched out from tech into much darker territory. He's one of the men responsible for the USA's drug crisis. He dealt in North Korean-made methamphetamine. He sold military-grade weapons such as missiles to very unsavory characters, had yachts carrying fortunes of drugs and gold, as well as planes stacked with cash and contraband. And if you worked for him, well, existence was tenuous. This is the story of a bona fide criminal mastermind, but one which differs from most tales about sociopathic wrongdoers. His activities spanned the globe and left trails of blood in their wake. But unlike most murderous villains, he started out writing code and trolling people on forums. In another life, he might well have worked for Apple, but he eventually ended up seeding the underworld with hardcore drugs and weapons. He's been called the kid, Wiz, who really, truly broke bad, who makes Walter White look like Mary Poppins, a nerd with an amazing aptitude for computer science, a kind of dangerous genius befitting the role of any villain you might find in a James Bond movie. As a kid, he was loved and doted on. He was a good student with tons of talent, and as an adult, he became an entrepreneurial crime lord who had few scruples about taking out his enemies or the people who worked most closely with him that he no longer trusted. How did this happen? How could such a brilliant young man with an ordinary life and acumen for creating complex algorithms turn into something resembling a person who might fit the title of Dr. Evil? Let's start from the beginning. LaRue was born on December 24, 1972, but was soon given up for adoption in his hometown of Bulawayo, the second largest city in Zimbabwe. Some sources say that his mother was a poor teenager and that there's no mention of his father on his birth certificate. Although in American journalist Evan Ratliff's book on LaRue, he called called The Mastermind, it said his father was a South African named Daryl Hornbuckle. That father, says the book, would later meet his son and actually get involved with some of the criminal activity. As for his mother, some sources say that she's actually married to a US senator. So much secrecy surrounds this guy, it's very hard to follow his story. For example, some people even claim he was the creator of Bitcoin, the one and only Satoshi Nakamoto. This is very unlikely, but after hearing his tale, well, anything would seem possible. What we know for sure is that LaRue was adopted into a caring family. They took him to another part of Zimbabwe, and it's said there he was loved and with his sister had a happy childhood. His new parents named him Paul Calder LaRue. The family left Zimbabwe shortly after Robert Mugabe came to power and ended white minority rule. They went to South Africa where the father found a good job working for a mining company, and this made them quite a wealthy family. LaRue had been described as a clever student, though the book about him says that he looked down on other students and called them dimwits. He had little interest in socializing or sports, but had a fondness for playing video games. His bios make him sound like quite a reclusive kid, and that apparently got worse after he was arrested aged either 15 or 16 for selling pornography. At this time, though, some of his talents were manifesting, and believing he didn't need school, the young boy dropped out and started learning programming. It said here he excelled and finished a one-year course in just eight weeks. At 17, he left South Africa and headed to the UK, where he found a job as a programmer and would meet his future wife. We really don't know that much about this time in his life, and most of the information we do know is from the book that we mentioned, with the author relying mainly on unnamed sources and police data to tell the story. He writes that LaRue spent some time in the US but quickly went over to Australia where he was granted citizenship. So far, there was nothing too out of the ordinary about this man except he was obviously gifted and fiercely independent. We know some things about his character because of messages he posted on a Usenet group in the 90s. It's obvious he understood encryption at a highly technical level, but you can also say that he trolled a lot of people and used racist language. This was maybe his first sign of unpleasantness, but also a sign that one day he would become what some people have called the world's most notorious cybercriminal. The author of the book we mentioned, Evan Ratliff, says on his website that he spoke to a person called Lulu, who gave him many details about LaRue in the early years. Indeed, it seems the young LaRue was obsessed with code, but as Ratliff writes, his life would turn out to resemble a cross between Bill Gates 
end, a mafia godfather. His genius could be seen in those posts he made online in his early days. But at the same time, he seemed quite moronic regarding his cultural outlook. He seemed to hate Australia and enjoy making his fellow countrymen mad. Word for word, he once wrote, as I recall, the genetic effects of human inbreeding are not as disastrous as those of breeding with animals, a lesson Australians have never learned. He also made a few spelling mistakes in there, so one might wonder if all his talents were in one basket. He once wrote, people like you should be rounded up, castrated, then shot, and that was a reply to someone who had gotten upset at him for saying that all Asians had DNA defects. You get the picture. This young, bright man had some very hateful opinions. In 1997, he created something called E4M, encryption for the masses. Radliff writes, LaRue's software allowed users to encrypt their entire hard drives and to conceal the existence of encrypted files so that prying eyes wouldn't ever know they were there. Remember, we have a loner of a kid, someone who has been arrested for pornography, and someone who hides behind a computer and insults racists. Encryption, you could say, suited his personality. After thousands of hours of programming and two years after he started E4M, he released it to the public. In his manifesto for his software, he wrote, The battle for privacy has long since been lost in the real world. As more and more human activity becomes computerized, governments are scrambling to preserve and extend their powers. According to LaRue, only strong encryption could save people from a government we shouldn't trust. If Big Brother was watching, LaRue was blowing smoke into his line of sight. We know that he got divorced and we're told it was a tempestuous breakup. He wasn't really making much money from his genius and after splitting up with his wife, he moved around a lot to Hong Kong and then to the Netherlands where he met his second wife and had a kid with her. He started another company with the Dutchman who later went on record saying that LaRue was desperate to earn money for his wife and kid. This partner said LaRue told him he wanted to be rich, to have what he wanted in life. But the partner said much of the time there was just something about LaRue that made him suspicious of him. His words were, LaRue came across as disingenuous. He did say that he was exceptionally talented though, and when he had to learn a new programming language to build an online casino website, he did it fast. The partner said, in one week he was better than most of the programmers I know that program in that language. It was around this time that he found out he was actually adopted, and some people have said this might have had something to do with how his character became somewhat aggressive and misanthropic, how he edged toward a darker side of existence. There are many cases of adopted kids being told the truth later in life and not taking it well. Still, he was a long way from killing his colleagues at this time. But soon he got out of the encryption business and started his criminal career. He created something of an online prescription drug empire known as RX Limited to the US government. He first did this with two Israeli brothers called Tomer and Boaz Taggart, whom he had met online. LaRue created a complex system which linked people eager to buy prescription drugs to doctors and pharmacists, and no doubt many Many of you have seen such sites where you can get your hands on prescription drugs easily. Soon, millions of people would start seeing the words buy drugs online in their inboxes. At this point, it said LaRue's appearance changed, and he became very fat and a little imposing. As a manager though, some people said he could be very good to work with and always listen to his employees. One person wrote, he was always buying gifts for people. His representation of himself, as far as I'm concerned, made him seem more legitimate. It said his RX business was at one point earning him $5 million dollars a month, but you wouldn't know it by looking at him as his preferred sartorial style was flip-flops and shorts. As a rich man, he acquired a bunch of different names, and at various points he was called John Bernard Bolins, Benny, Alex, Johann William Smith, and William Vaughn. He also created a slew of shell companies and RX spawned a few other rogue online pharmacies. Later, LaRue would be accused of being the man or one of the main men behind drug addiction epidemics all over the world. That wasn't just the online stuff though, but we'll get around to his hardcore substance business later. It said what he was doing wasn't exactly illegal, but operated in a gray area. He made both the buyers and the people prescribing the drugs think everything was legitimate, but what he'd really done was create a way for people to get their hands on drugs that was much easier than doing it the traditional way. Inboxes all over the globe were filled with spam emails from his dodgy online pharmacies. He had call centers in Israel and also in the Philippines and business was booming. At this point, one of the managers working for LaRue in Israel had the idea of starting a similar business while also working for him. The shorter story 
is that this guy was almost murdered by the man named Dave Smith, the security boss for LaRue. But LaRue wasn't happy with just many, many millions. He wanted a lot more. He bought land in Zimbabwe with a plan to give it back to the white farmers who LaRue said had unfairly taken from them under the Mugabe government. He also got into logging in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but that didn't last long. Still, he wanted more, and this tech wizard was now willing to get his hands dirty, or should we say, filthy. His former associate would tell Ratliff, the only way to do that was illegal. He was living inside a movie, you could almost say. He always had a dark side, it just developed more with money. At this point, he moved to Manila, and from there, with many staff and soldiers as security, LaRue entered into new businesses, which included large drug shipments, arms trafficking, and a fair bit of money laundering. He used Hong Kong as his financial hub, and there he had houses stuffed with gold bars, silver, and diamonds. He had former elite Israeli, British, and American soldiers making sure no one took any of that from him. He also had all those shell companies, and when he moved stuff around, he used his own boats or private planes. It was difficult for anyone to track what he was doing because, of course, he was a master of encryption. Different names and passports also helped. What is also interesting is that his encryption tech had been used to help Edward Snowden release all those documents that unearthed a lot of US military secrets. The National Security Agency weren't up to cracking that encryption. The US was no doubt interested in LaRue, and it would later be found out that he was behind an arms trade on a boat called the Captain Ufuk. When the Philippine Coast Guard became suspicious of this ship, they stopped it and on board found crates full of SS-1 assault rifles and other guns. It's thought the shipment was on its way to a terrorist organization. La Plata Trading, one of LaRue's companies, had purchased that ship. Arms dealing was one of his main activities, and LaRue was also behind a shipment of AK-47 assault rifles and light machine guns sent to Somali militias. There are rumors that LaRue intended to invade the Maldives with his own militia but that's likely not the truth. What most people think he was doing was creating a force to fight off Somali pirates, who had been causing havoc on the high seas. It didn't stop there. LaRue was also said to have been involved with trying to ship missile guidance systems to Iran. We don't know the full extent of his arms dealing activities, but let's just say he had his finger in a lot of dirty pies and he didn't seem to have scruples regarding whom he sold arms to. Then back to the drugs, because LaRue never gave up on them as a way to make money. It's said he was involved in plantations where the coca leaf was grown, that he had several operations involving the cultivation and distribution of various drugs worldwide, including opium and cannabis. And with this and arms dealing and so much money and gold around, he needed a lot of protection. One person who was his main hitman for a while, a former American drill sergeant and sniper instructor, was said to have done hits for LaRue and also recruited other mercenaries that had once been soldiers or defense contractors. In terms of violence, he had the best working for him. In terms of the death toll, it's likely higher than he has admitted to. And many people did go missing, with LaRue giving the orders each time and on occasions likely being there. A man named Bruce Jones, who was implicated in the Captain Ufuk arms shipment, was put into the witness protection program. Program, but that didn't save him. He was assassinated in Manila on his way home from a shopping mall after he had grown confident enough to go out in the streets again. LaRue was never convicted for the hit, but many think he was behind it. Ratliff writes that LaRue was becoming paranoid, and he was more than willing to take out anyone who he thought might interrupt his business and lifestyle. Even Jones's own lawyer, a man named Joe Frank Zuniga, left his house one day and was never seen again. Another man, Mike Lontock, who had worked for one of LaRue's shady companies, met the same fate. He was shot in his car at an intersection in Manila after he stopped when he got a phone call. Four men got in front of the car and shot at the driver with Uzis and handguns. Later, Lontock's wife would say he'd been involved in arms deals and couldn't get out of the business. LaRue was never convicted, but it's said by some sources that the person behind it was simply the mastermind. Another man involved with that fatal shipment on the Captain Ufuk also went missing. His name was Herbert Ten Two. There was good reason for thinking all of this was LaRue's work, because one of his hitmen, named Ronald Barraquatro, was arrested, and at his house police found a kill list. He'd been employed by Dave Smith, but denied killing Lontok, even though that's what some people thought. Barraquatro did tell the cops, though, that he'd been hired to take out a journalist that had gotten too close to the truth. The long and short of it is, they all worked for one man. 
the mastermind. LaRue moved to Rio when things heated up and from there planned to do some drug shipments via yacht to Ecuador. One shipment didn't work out and a dead man was found on a washed up ship along with $120 million worth of cocaine. And it just gets murkier and murkier. LaRue admitted to ordering a hit on a woman named Noemi Edelor. She was a real estate agent but had dealings with LaRue and had told him she could pay a bribe to get illegal goods through customs. Apparently, she didn't go through with that. So, some of LaRue's hitmen pretended to be looking for a house with her one day and killed her at a place that was quiet. Another woman was killed in a similar way. Her name was Catherine Lee, and LaRue ordered her murder when a property deal with him went sour. He'd been ripped off three million bucks and that was never going to be anything but a a death sentence for the people behind it. LaRue admitted to ordering the hit in court later but was not convicted of the murder because of an agreement he had made with the authorities. The bodies had been piling up and Ratliff said that LaRue had created a climate of absolute fear. While all this was going on, LaRue was still doing drug business with the Colombians and elsewhere and the DEA were on to him. They knew he was behind those online pharmacies and they also knew he was shipping large quantities of ingredients used to make crystal methamphetamine. Throw the words North North Korea and Iran into the mix, and the Americans were prowling around like caged tigers smelling blood not too far away. They soon discovered a whole bunch of companies run by LaRue, and with them a lot of aliases he had used. Ratliff writes that the DEA compared this once hardworking tech nerd with Sinaloa cartel head Joaquin El Chapo Guzman and Taliban affiliated heroin trafficker Bashir Nozai. He also said that LaRue just got greedy and that he should have left the online drug business early and not branched out. There was no need, he already had millions. Criminal sociopaths, though, rarely hang up their gloves in their prime. It was the prescription pill business they were planning to get him for, not all the other crimes we've mentioned. It's not clear anyway exactly what the DEA knew at this point, but they discovered enough to make him a major target. But when they tapped his phone in 2012, they discovered something else. That was he or at least his associates had a warehouse in Hong Kong containing 24 tons of ammonium nitrate fertilizer in 960 bags labeled as sodium chloride. In Radliff's words, enough to create an explosion 10 times bigger than the one used in the Oklahoma City bombing. Around this time, LaRue and his operatives were moving millions of dollars of gold around, likely knowing they were about to find themselves in deep water. Millions more dollars were being shifted around, and all the while some of the drug business was still going on. He was walking on thin ice while trying to protect his vast fortune. The master coder was now trying to encrypt his very existence, but tangible goods aren't as easy to hide as data. LaRue was arrested by Liberian police in an operation which included DEA agents posing as Colombian cartel members. He'd gone over to Liberia for a meeting with this fake cartel member to sort out a deal involving a large shipment of methamphetamine. Then he got stung. He was handed over to the DEA after the police in Liberia refused to take a bribe. But LaRue subsequently agreed to work with the DEA, and so no one actually knew he'd been arrested. This is what he said, according to Ratliff, who was interviewed by Vice Magazine. I'll cooperate. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison. What do you want to know? Life went on as normal. He carried on doing his deals with criminals, which led to lots of DEA stings. Many of LaRue's associates went down after that. Some of those arrested were what are called mercenaries, and most of those were former soldiers who had been enforcers for LaRue, with the most notable of them being nicknamed Rambo. According to Ratliff, there were scores of these mercenaries all over the world working for LaRue. Ratliff said they liked the money, but they more than likely loved the thrill of the job. In 2014, LaRue pled guilty to trafficking methamphetamine, selling technology to Iran, ordering or participating in seven murders, and also fraud along with bribery. Since he had helped the DEA arrest many of his associates, the US government agreed to keep his family safe. He's still awaiting sentencing as we write this, and he might actually get out of prison at a reasonably young age. He actually got off with the murders because of his cooperation with the DEA in bringing down killers and other criminals. What Ratliff likes to point out a lot, too, is that while LaRue was involved in so much depravity, blood spilling, deals with guerrillas and mafias, he did most of his work through his laptop. He kept his head down and arranged for things to happen with his machine. A machine nobody, including the NSA, FBI, you name it, could crack. 
and that's the story of perhaps the world's most notorious cyber criminal, a man who in some ways defied what we think of as a master villain, a nerd with a nefarious nature, a brilliant mind bent on wickedness and hate, and a story we guess that has not yet been fully told. Hackers are a real threat both to individuals and businesses, and not just the super mastermind ones like Paul LaRue, but knowing how to protect yourself online is hard, which is why we here at the Infographic Show use Dashlane, the one and only tool you need to stay safe online. We've been using Dashlane for months and can't imagine life without it anymore. With a VPN, password generator, and breach alerts for when websites you have logins for suffer breaches or hacks, Dashlane will actively work to protect you across all your devices and online accounts so you don't have to. So protect yourself from both the masterminds and the everyday hackers by heading on over to www.dashlane.com slash infographics for a free 30-day trial. And if you use the coupon code infographics, you can get 10% off a premium subscription today. What do you think about this tale? Tell us in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video, The White American Who Climbed the Ranks of the Chinese Mafia. Thanks for watching and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.